Hi, Farwell Chess Club. This is John Wheaton, coach with Inland Chess Academy. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a video today for you uh, to take place of class since we're not able to do chat class as a result of the, the coronavirus. Um, today, what I want to do is I want to look at a game with you. Uh, we looked at uh, one of Robert Fisher's games in another class. In this class, we're going to look at uh, one of his games in the World Championship match in the 70s against Boris Spassky. Um, this was a big match that take, took place in Iceland, and um, it was big because the Cold War was going on at the time, and the, the Americans and the Russians had a lot of rivalry, and so this was an American, Bobby Fischer, playing against a Russian, Boris Spassky. In this game... Uh, Bobby Fischer is playing with white, Boris Gasky is playing with black, and we're going to focus on some of the uh, elements we've talked about in class about the opening, and then also some tactical ideas that come up later in the game. Um, so let's start off uh, with the first moves of the game. Um, Bobby Fischer plays e4. This is called the King's Pawn opening, one of the main ways to start a chess game. Boris Vasky plays uh, d5, or excuse me, he plays e5. Um, this is one of the main ways to respond to e4. Um, the other main way is c5, which is the uh, Sicilian. So we get a few moves here. Uh, white plays knight to f3. The idea here is to attack black's pawn on e5 uh, and also to gain control of the center, develop his knight in the process. Black responds by protecting his pawn on e5 with the knight, um, also gaining control of the center and developing his piece. Next we have bishop b5. Uh, bishop b5 is uh, kind of the opening move of the Roy Lopez opening, which we've talked about in class. The idea is to challenge uh, White's or Black's knight, which is defending his pawn, and uh, in the process, uh, you know, create an additional attack on the pawn. <clears throat> so Black plays a6, attacking the bishop. Um, note right now that um, White can't just win a pawn because if if White takes the knight now, Black recaptures with the pawn on d7. White takes the pawn on e5. In the end of that, black can play queen to d4 and and attack both white's knight and pawn. Uh, white can't keep both. So as a result, white, white doesn't go for that and just backs up his bishop. Um, black plays knight to f6, attacking white's pawn. Um, <clears throat> and here, uh, white just castles. Um, which gives black an option. Black could next uh, attack white's pawn on, on e4, or white could take black's pawn on e4 with his knight. Uh, but at the end of those lines, what happens is white can play rook, uh, white can play his rook to e1 and attack both the knight and the pawn, and white's eventually going to win a pawn back there. So instead, black just uh, continues to develop it, Moving his black, uh, moving his, his dark squared bishop out of the way so that his king can castle. Remember, it's it's really important to get your king castled in the opening stage of the game so that it, uh, your king can be safe from the enemy's pieces in the latter stages of the game. <clears throat> so white does now protect his pawn with his rook. He moves his rook to e1, protecting his pawn on e4. Um, and black plays b5, um, again attack, attacking white's bishop. Uh, this is one of black's ideas in this opening to, to, to attack white's bishop several times. And uh, in doing so, white, black gets space on the queen side. His pawns are moving forward. He gets space on the, on the queen side, which allows some of his pieces to develop. Um, so... Black moves his pawn to d6, we see. Uh, and then we get white's, white's move, c3. Uh, this is one of white's 
main ideas in, in this opening. Uh, what White's plan is is to move his pawn on d2 to d4, but when he does so, he wants to be able to recapture, after Black takes that pawn on d4, he wants to be able to recapture with his pawn on c3, which would give him a big center of two pawns and control a lot of squares in, in the center. Uh, so to do this, he uh, to make this plan possible, he, he, he moves a pawn to c3 to eventually be able to recapture uh, with, with his pawn. Black castles to get his king safe. Uh, so as we talked about in class, uh, when kings are castled on the same side, um, you often don't want to rush the pawns forward in front of your king because even though it seems like you might be attacking your opponent's king, you're making your own king weaker in the process. And uh, when you're opposite, castled on opposite sides, then you can sometimes rush your pawns forward at the enemy's king because in that case you would not be weakening your own king. Uh, black plays or excuse me, white plays h3. This is often a useful move to prevent black's bishop from coming to g4 and pinning his knight to the queen. <clears throat> now we have kind of a funny move for black, knight back to b8. Um, this is funny because it seems to be kind of undeveloping black's piece that he's already developed. But he's doing this so that he can uh, with the idea of moving his black pawn on c7 to c5 eventually, gaining more space on the queen side, which is one of his main plans at this point. Um, but he has to get his knight out of the way of the pawn first um, to, to be able to play that move later. Okay. So white does go forward with uh, d4, the plan that we were talking about. White and black redevelops his knight to d7 white develops his other knight remember in the opening it's really important to continue to develop get all your pieces out in the board towards the center um, because that would give you the maximum chances to make use of those pieces black develops his bishop to b7 uh, so he's eyeing white's pawn on e4 uh, for a potential attack White moves his pawn to c2. Note that both the white's bishops are now pointing towards black's king side, so there could be a possibility of an attack on black's king side in the future. At this point, there's some maneuvering. Um, white plays b4, and uh, he, white partially wants to make it more difficult for black to go forward with c5. He, look, his two pawn, white's two pawns now, and b4 and d4 are clamping down on that square to make black's plan of expansion a little more tricky. <clears throat> Black um, moves his, his bishop out of the way. Uh, note that now uh, the rook is also staring down white's pawn on, on e4. If, if black were to eventually take on, on d4 with his own pawn, then there would be... Uh, there were three attackers on the white pawn on e4. Now we see um, white playing a4. At this point, white is playing on both sides of the board. We mentioned that he has potential attack in the future, but um, he's playing his pawn forward to a4 with the idea of eventually taking on b5 with his pawn. Black would recapture back with his pawn on b5, but that pawn might, might get a little weak on b5. So. That's one of the reasons that White's playing on both sides of the board. Often it's good to play on both sides of the board um, so that, you know, your opponent has two things to think about. Okay, so Black's developing his knight again. White's kicking that knight with a pawn move, saying, saying I want more space on the queen side, get back knight. And uh, Black, White's developing his final bishop that needed developing, so now um, his minor pieces are all off the, the, the first rank, which is, is what we look for when we're developing our pieces in the opening. <clears throat> we have a few moves here. I'm not going to talk about every move because there's a lot of them in this game, but um, we see that Black does play this idea of c5. 
eventually, even though white tried to tried to make it more difficult. Black, that's one of me, black's main plans. So you played it here. Uh, white takes, black takes, white takes on e5, knight takes on e5, knight takes on e5, queen to e5. And here I wanted to point out a tactic um, that white's going to play here with c4. You'll note c4 uh, opens up white's bishop to attack black's queen. It's called a discovered attack, as we've talked about in class. Uh, so black has to think about moving his queen now because the bishop's attacking him. So black does that, moves his queen to f4. White takes the knight on f6. Black recaptures with his queen. He could have recaptured with his pawn, but um, you don't generally want to take back with a pawn in that sort of situation because doing that would open up a file to black's king and makes black's king a little unsafer, which is why he took back with the queen. <clears throat> okay, so let's come to this move. Black just played rook to d8. You notice there's a pin here. Black is pinning white's knight to his queen. If white's knight moves, black would be able to play rook takes d1 and win white's queen. So white plays queen c run, queen c1 to get out of the pin. Uh, here we have another tactic. Black plays queen to c3. It's, it's a, called a double attack. It's attacking both the knight on d2 and the pawn on a5. Uh, white can't really save them both. So he saves his knight, it's more valuable. Black takes the pawn. So black's up a pawn for now. But we'll see in the next couple moves that with white's queen coming out to f4, white's getting an attack. He lost a pawn, but he's getting an attack in exchange. Um, white's queen is now attacking, white's queen and bishop, I should say, are both attacking the pawn on f7. Um, and if black were to do nothing, white would play queen takes f7, black would play king to f8, and white would play queen to g8, checkmate. So white, so black has to defend that square. Black plays rook to d7, defending the pawn on f7. Now another tactic, white plays knight to e5, um, it's actually forking the rook and the weak pawn that we just discussed on f7. So that's a problem for black. Um, How is he going to deal with those threats? And he does that with another tactic. So you can see the tactics really coming into play here. Black plays queen to c7, pinning the knight to white's queen. If, if white were to play knight takes f7 now, black could play queen takes f4 and win white's queen. So, uh, a few more moves happen. And here we'll see that white does eventually take um, on f7. And uh, although it may seem at first that that's not going to work, you'd think at first it's not going to work because um, basically black has three pieces that uh, can take back. Uh, so, so why is white able to take with the bishop there? Uh, we'll, we'll see why. So white basically, uh, this results in an exchange of a bunch of pieces. And here's the point of white's play. The point is that now, if black's king is to take f7, then, uh, then white could play rook to d7, forking black's king and bishop. And black can't hold on to the bishop. Black would lose the bishop. So um, instead, black realizes he can't. He he can't both capture the knight and keep the black bishop. So he he just takes a pawn while he can with the bishop. You now see that um, after black takes the knight, white is up material because uh, white has two rooks. Each rooks are generally worth five. Uh, a bishop is worth three, so black, uh, white has uh, two rooks, three pawns, that's generally about 13. Uh, a bishop's worth three, as we mentioned, so black has um, a rook and a bishop, 
which is 8 plus 4 pawns, which is 12. So that's, that's one, one less in total. So whites up material here. Um, we're going to move forward some games. Okay, here we'll see White getting his rook behind that opponent's passed, one of the opponent's uh, passed pawns. Remember, a passed pawn is a pawn that has no enemy pawns in front of it that can block it. So here, Black's pawns on B5 and C5 are both passed pawns. So it's a good idea for White to get a rook behind those pawns um, to... Uh, so that when those move, pawns try to move forward, White's rook can try to prevent them from, from queening. Uh, here we have Black's rook checking the White king. White's king moves away. Black's bishop attacking the White's king. Pawn block. So Black's trying to get counterplay against White's king, gets make some threats against White's king. Um, Now black plays um, b4, because white was threatening that pawn with his rook. And he, so he advances that pawn to protect the pawn. White's king uh, starts to come towards the center. Uh, in end games, it's, uh, it's often important for the king to come towards the center, because in the end games, when the queens are off the board, the kings are a little safer, and the kings can be a powerful piece in a... In a in attacking enemy pawns and pieces. So in the end games, the king often wants to come towards the center and become a more important piece. Here we see another tactic. Black, white is moving his pawn, sorry, white is moving his rook to b6, pinning the black bishop to d6. Black can't move his bishop now because it would put his king in check. So that would be an illegal move. So black has to defend his bishop. And again, we see White's plan of moving his king toward the center, making the king a powerful piece in the endgame. Here, Black steps out of the pan so that he can move his bishop now when he needs to. White is attacking the rook now uh, with his king. And we see White's trying to get his own pawns going forward now. White, White needs to, to win this game. White need, need to try to create his own pass pawn. Um, and so he needs to advance his own pawns. So that's White's plan here. And now after this move, White's pawn on F5 uh, is a passed pawn. So White has the threat of eventually queening that pawn um, if you know he can get around Black's Black's king on F7. <clears throat> so here. Uh, white wins a pawn by a tactic, another tactic. So you'll notice black's pawn on c5 is pinned to his king, or it's pinned to his rook on d5. So white can play rook takes b4. If the pawn recaptures, then white's rook on b5 can take the rook on d5. So that just wins black white even more material. So now we're going to skip through most of this uh, kind of more quickly. Um, white wins a pawn there, you'll see. And in this position, uh, black resigns. Um, it's hard for black to stop. White's plan of moving his pawns forward uh, to, to queen them on f8 and g8. And you notice that if, if uh, Black's bishop takes the pawn on f6 in this position, White could uh, think about a skewer moving his rook on uh, b1 to d1, skewering the king, and, and then taking the rook on d7. So. Uh, you'll notice here in this final position, white's up uh, 12. White has a piece and pawn value of 12, and black's piece and pawn value is 9. So it's part of the reason black resigned in this position. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that game. 
Um, I really enjoyed uh, being a coach in your class this quarter, and I hope you're doing, you and your family uh, are safe at home during this trying time. Um, I would invite you now to, to uh, please go play a game with a, a family member or relative over the board if you can. Um, if, if you're not able to do that, there's online options such as going to chess.com and playing a game, uh, playing a game there, which is also a good option during these, these times where over the board games become more difficult. Um, Inland Chess is going to award, uh, like just like last quarter, awards to several students in the class. Um, the parents of those students will be contacted if the if a, if a student receives an award and they can pick up the award of the Chess Pro Shop for, for Inland Chess Academy on Argon. So thank you again. I uh, hope you enjoyed this game and I uh, look forward to teaching you more in the future.